All right, good afternoon everyone. My name is Ismail Shakhtakhtinsky and I'm the principal immigration attorney at IS Law Firm. I just finished an individual hearing uh, in a case um, held remotely with Arlington Immigration Court. I just wanted to share with you this case information and the results. Um, just from the beginning, I'll let you know that thankfully we were successful. It was a very difficult case that has been pending in removal proceedings in immigration court for 13 years. And this was not a traditional case of an asylum being referred to immigration court or undocumented aliens being placed in removal proceedings. This was a very interesting case, which unfortunately last has been lasting so long and has taken significant toll on this family. So my clients, uh, are uh, South Koreans who entered the United States um, most more than 22 years ago and were sponsored for permanent residency through employment. Um, many years after their entry into the U.S., they applied for citizenship, and at the citizenship interview, the at DHS the uh, officer, the officer of USCIS, has asked them some questions from 20 years back about their past employment to which they gave inconsistent answers. They've studied for the citizenship test questions and the citizenship application in English language, learn to the extent that they could take those tests, but at the citizenship interview, they have been asked an array of questions in English, which they part of which they did not understand, and they provided some inconsistent answers. In response to this, the DHS did some other, other investigations and found out some inconsistencies in the employment history of the respondent in South Korea. And the extent of the DHS investigations, I want to reveal to you that they spoke to the South Korean consulate and embassy and re reviewed some of the South Korean tax department records to see and find some inconsistencies. But all of those inconsistencies that the DHS were alleging um, were reconcilable and explainable by the respondents. So today was the individual hearing, which was delayed for a significant amount of time before, um, because the respondents had different counsel uh, before they hired me in this case, and then they also, the government served the wrong notice to appear, notices to appear, which I disputed in court, and the court could have dismissed the case back then, but the court allowed the government to cure the mistakes in their NTAs and to reissue new ones, and then we disputed the removability. So the difference between this case and many other cases that are typical in immigration courts is that usually the removability is admitted, considered, and then the respondent applies for some kind of benefit, like asylum or cancellation of removal and so on. In this case, we disputed the removability, um, and the court set the individual hearing date. And then eventually the Hearing was uh, rescheduled and pushed forward for quite some time, and then the pandemic pushed it even further into the future. And now finally today, after about 13 years of being in removal proceedings, the respondents had their chance to be heard. Um, and one of the factor, interesting factor here was that the immigration judge who handled the case previously, who knew about the case, is no longer in this court, and there was a new judge um, who was appointed by um, uh, William Barr, the Trump administration, who presided over this case, and I found very thorough, very um, detailed, and, and very attentive uh, to the case. And, and after listening to the testimony uh, that we presented, well, first of all, before testimony, what we did is I filed a brief with the court um, arguing that it was the government's burden of proof. So typically in removal proceedings in immigration courts, it's the burden of proof of the applicant to apply and confirm and convince the court, court that they are eligible for the benefit. In this case, since they were already permanent residents, I argued that it was the government's burden of proof and the court agreed that the government has to present the case by clear and convincing evidence. And this is a high burden of proof for the government to, to demonstrate that this respondents engaged in some fraud by providing documents, false documents or false information at the time of their green card application. Uh, we were also able to contact some um, individuals in South Korea and obtain affidavits and additional evidence confirming that the respondent worked there. Uh, and um, today we had the individual hearing. Um, 
I, although I could have argued that the government should start presenting its case because it has the burden of proof, but I went ahead and decided to question the respondent myself rather than allowing the government to first start. And I think that was a very crucial decision because I didn't want the government attorney to be questioning the respondent and then trying to trip her off in her statements and then, you know, show the court any inconsistencies because then it becomes very hard to cure. And I don't think the respondent would have tripped because she's truly truthful, honest about this case and I completely whole, wholeheartedly believe that they have never presented any false information um, to the Department of Labor, DHS, or to the court today. Um, but we were able to explain the inconsistencies. Part of the argument was that the government at the time of citizenship application in such an interview, uh, test the English language to the extent of the application. In fact, the instructions in the citizenship application specifically state that the English language test is limited to the extent of the applicant understanding, you know, casual conversation, hello, how are you, and so on, and the uh, form itself, the N-400, and the test questions, obviously, that are being asked during the citizenship uh, interview. But the officer, I argued, went beyond that, asking extra questions in English language, didn't bother to invite a Korean interpreter who could have interpreted um, for the respondents to make sure that these answers are correct and fully understood and those responses are fully, you know, the respondent, respondents are fully informed about the nature of the questions. Um, I, the government also produced evidence um, in form of evidence, a sworn uh, record of sworn statements where the respondent signed at the citizenship interview where inviting the officer wrote questions and answers and the respondent signed apparently in back in 2013 that that you know those answers were correct as to what she stated at the interview. I also argued that the government at that point at least could have brought the interpreter. Now they are making a record of what the respondent said without having an interpreter where they clearly know that the respondent is not fluent in English. Again, the respondent doesn't have to be fluent or the applicant doesn't have to be fluent in English to qualify for citizenship. And thankfully the court agreed with our arguments and that the respondents, um, the applicants' responses were consistent today and were reason gave reasonable explanation about any inconsistent answers at the citizenship application. Um, furthermore, the government the, in this case also tried to produce introduce evidence in court today, evidence of some documents they have obtained through their investigation or sources through South Korean authorities. Um, I objected as not being timely and I pointed out to the court that this case has been pending for, as I said, 13 years. The government had ample opportunity to do so. It's been continued multiple times, but why would the government now, on the day of the hearing, prejudicially to us, produce evidence that was never produced before, not only just to court, but also to us, and the court agreed um, we did discuss the contents, possible contents of those documents, and the court agreed that those documents should not be admitted, and the government had ample opportunity to produce it beforehand. So eventually, after a lengthy hearing, I think we started at 8.30, and it's about 12.30 to now, so it went non-stop for about four hours. Um, the government agreed with our position, that the, gov the, the court agreed with our position that the DHS did not meet its burden of proof and agreed that this uh, removal proceedings should be terminated and the respondents, my clients, should uh, maintain their permanent residence in the United States and, you know, hopefully they will also qualify for citizenship soon. I mean, they can qualify now, so we'll probably apply, reapply for their citizenship. Uh, the DHS preserved its appeal, but I hope they come to terms with this decision. I hope they understand that this action by the government to try to uproot the lives of these individuals after 22 years in the U.S. and then, you know it has had a lot of emotional, significant emotional toll on this family, um, you know, who have been productive and effective members of this community. Of course, those are not the arguments I made in court. I didn't, you know, say, oh, even if they 
committed fraud, let them stay because they're nice people. But I, but I hope that goes, uh, and, I, and I did state that to the government after the close of the record, after the close of the hearing, that you know, hopefully they come to terms with this and realize that first they, they made this you know, crusade on, based on some misunderstanding and um, you know, circumstantial evidence that they believed somebody probably took initiative instead of focusing on you know, uh, undocumented immigrants who might have committed crimes or who have you know, clearly presented false information or continue presenting false documents and so on, the government focuses its resources on trying to piece together things as if you know, these individuals who have misinformed the government about her employment record in the past. I'm not blaming the government for doing that. I'm just saying there are many more important priorities of the Department of Homeland Security today, considering that there are you know, more than 15 million undocumented aliens and you know, just statistically, even if less than general population, statistically, some of them um, have criminal records. And what, that's what the Biden administration has been focusing on, trying to remove and, and deport from the United States. Those individuals trying to focus the resources of the immigration courts and the DHS and the Immigration Customs Enforcement on those individuals who committed crimes. Um, so anyway, I hope the government you know, reconsiders, the, the DHS reconsiders its priorities and not, you know, uh, waste the resources of the taxpayers and the courts on the cases with such distant arguments and hunch, you know, the cases based on hunch, which somebody builds in their mind, some probably officer at the citizenship interview decided to get a promotion and trying to find and dig and investigate uh, something that, that they couldn't. Um, but, you know, the lesson for uh, applicants and for uh, immigrants who file for citizenship is that once you uh, file for citizenship, the USCIS, it's not, once you become a permanent resident, it's not over. The USCIS goes back in your entire immigration history and you know from this case how deep they went. And nothing wrong with that as long as you haven't committed any fraud or mis misinformed anything. But the challenges you have is that, just like in this case, misunderstandings which are going to be held against you. So I've seen many cases where somebody obtained asylum, you know, as part of the asylum claim, they credibly testified and got asylum because mm -hmm. they have been detained, arrested, or charged with bogus crimes because of their political opinions or participation in protests. And then down the road, they file for, you know, green card, and then many years later for citizenship and so on. And, you know, in the answering of those questions, either in the forms, because the forms ask very thorough, detailed questions, they indicate no to arrests, or at the interview, they forgot and they give confusing answers, and the government is holding on to the end of that string and starts pulling more information and tries to dig <laughs> and find you know, other evidence and then try to, you know, I have a pending case also from now about 15 years ago, who someone who obtained asylum and then the government reopens their case and puts them in removal proceedings to reconsider the asylum application. I mean, you can imagine how devastating it is. And a lot of times uh, it is just honest mistake or, you know, confusion or misunderstanding as it was in this case. Um, but you know, I wouldn't say the government doesn't care, the DHS does care, but the, the truth of reality is the individuals or groups of individuals who work for the government in the investigation department or, you know, for the DHS, uh, ICE chief counsel's office, when they get into the case, when they have this idea or preconception in their pre preconceived, you know, presumption in their head that, oh, this person might have, must have lied because now they're saying this and they said the other thing 15 years ago. It's hard to, you know, it's just a human nature. Once you get into trying to prove something, you make yourself believe it in it so much that you decide to go all in or even double down on, on, on the allegations. So what I'm trying to say is that the government is, the DHS is very thorough, very detailed, and a lot of times they go in the wrong direction, but they're going to go all the way to the end cause you all these troubles, many years of uncertainty and so on, 
unless everything you say, everything you do is very consistent and meticulously prepared very carefully without any information that could cause for the government to hold to the end of the string and then pull it out until everything falls apart. So be very careful. Again, uh, uh, there is nothing wrong. There is no reason whatsoever not to hire an attorney for the purpose of preparing and filing a citizenship application or handling your citizenship interview. In fact, the government likes that. The officers also like it because they also don't like these issues that come up in the in the beginning. Now, as I said, once they get find this issue, they think, okay, they are onto something and then they get deep into it and then you know they 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 they, they get excited that they found something and they're gonna prove something in the court and, and win the case. Um, but unfortunately that takes toll on you, on your livelihood, these individuals, if they have an attorney at the time of citizenship, the attorney would make sure would make sure that you know they do get the uh, translator when those questions come up. Um, will make sure that they're very well prepared, that everything is consistent and so on and so forth. And they would have become U.S. citizens 13 years ago or more than that. Um, but they have not. And unfortunately, that's because they were they were not represented. They were unrepresented. Um, so uh, thank you for listening. Just wanted to share this case result. I see my clients, the hearing just ended. I just turned off my computer. Um, but I see my clients are calling me, they're celebrating. Um, again, unfortunately, the government reserved the appeal. That means within 30 days they have to file appeal. I don't expect they will. Um, hopefully, again, they realize, uh, the DHS realizes and comes to terms with the decision of the court, which was very thorough, fair, and detailed. Uh, but if they do, hey, you know, I've had cases uh, where the government appealed, then you know, every case has its own facts and the results. Prior results don't guarantee the same result. But I can tell you that I've, it's ne the government has never won appeals in my cases. I've had appealed cases by the government, asylum cases, and so on. And there's never been a case where appeal was won by the government in the cases I handled because I am convinced that this was a correct decision. Um, although I've had cases that I appealed and I've won against the government. Um, on numerous occasions, several occasions, I want to say numerous because there are not that many decisions being appealed. Um, but so, thank you very much for listening. I hope it's a lesson for everyone. Uh, let me get back to calling my clients and congratulating them, and I will explain them what this decision means and what the possibility of appeal means. Thank you very much. Please subscribe to our channel and hit like, and I appreciate your time listening to me. Bye bye.